Many people are surprised when I tell them that how you breathe and how you move actually affects the choice of food you make and how much you eat. Before I go into the understanding of this, it's important to appreciate that we live very unnatural lives. And one of the most unnatural things that we do is sit in chairs. And sitting in chairs for most people is you know, five to 15 hours a day in the modern world. And as an exercise based physiotherapist, one of the most common things that we say is sitting is the new smoking. Sitting has a very, very detrimental effect on the body. When you sit for long periods of time, the front of the hips become very, very tense. And in particular, a muscle called the psoas muscle, which comes from the inner thigh and attaches to the lower back, becomes very taut. When that muscle becomes tense, it actually pulls you into a backward bend. I mean, you can imagine, if you're sitting like this all day and the muscle at the front of the hip becomes tense, you will stand up bending forward. And you see many elderly people walking, bending forward. Young people are lucky, lucky enough to have a fairly flexible lower back and they arch it backwards, so, which means when they're standing, they're compressed at the front of the hips and the lower back. This leads to lower back pain, energy drain, because the lower back is actually the seat of our uh, the major outside of the core of the body where the energy sources really uh, manifest from. The front of the hips becoming tense cause long-term hip problems. Back of the body and the lower back becoming tense causes energy drain and lower back problems. The combination actually starts to seize up the entire trunk. And many people will try and actually protect their lower backs and alleviate lower back pain with this very erroneous thing of pulling the navel to the spine in a way that does not help them. Many people are pulling the navel to the spine using the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation. And the effect of using these muscles, which are effectively oblique abdominal muscles, is to inhibit the diaphragm. The diaphragm is the main muscle of breathing. When the diaphragm doesn't work properly, your autonomic nervous system becomes dysfunctional. The autonomic or automatic nervous system has two parts which are quite well known. One is euphemistically called the flight or fight response, which is technically called the sympathetic nervous system. The other is the parasympathetic nervous system, euphemistically known as the rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, regeneration mode. It's when your parasympathetic nervous system is dominant that you actually start to get healthy function of your digestive system immune system, reproductive system. And this is also when you feel calm, when you feel peaceful, when you feel in a loving, trusting state. If your sympathetic nervous system is dominating, your digestive system switches off. You can't absorb food well, you can't absorb nutrients, digest your food, you can't eliminate wastes, you can't get rid of toxins. Your immune system won't allow you to heal properly, to recover from sickness or injury or to even prevent the possibility of becoming infected with any sort of pathogen. Plus, you can't reproduce cells properly, so you will not regenerate your body. It is really important that most of the time we have a state, what we can call parasympathetic dominance. And it's also very important that blood flows very effectively through our body so that the energy in our body can be equally spread. If our body is not equally and fairly getting energy, getting blood flow, then you will not feel like you have energy. And so blood flow is very important, but most people think that healthy blood flow means getting your heart rate up. But getting your heart rate up is actually a sign of sympathetic overload. The more your heart beats, the body thinks it's in a sympathetically dominant state, i.e. it feels stressed. It will turn off your immune system, digestive system, reproductive system. This will also happen, this turning off of your immune system, reproductive system, digestive system, will also take place if you breathe too much. And what happens is, if your psoas becomes too tight, and your back becomes a bit squashed, and your spine becomes stiff because you're trying to protect yourself from pain or you're in pain, then the combination of all these things will lead to inhibition of the diaphragm. Let's look at the psoas for a moment. It goes, this muscle, the psoas, a hip flexor, comes from the inner thigh to the lower back, 
it doesn't just join onto your lower back. It actually joins onto your diaphragm. So when the diaphragm contracts, which is what it does when it, uh, when you do an abdominal inhalation, the diaphragm sits like a dome shape around the abdomen. When the diaphragm muscle, your main muscle of breathing, uh, becomes contracted, which is what happens on inhalation, it goes from a large dome, sh- dome shape to a flattened shape. And that contraction downwards, that pulling downwards, creates a vacuum-like suction pressure in the upper part of your trunk, which is what pulls air into your nose if your nose is open. Now, when the exhalation takes place, the diaphragm moves back up to its dome shape. But if the psoas muscle, that muscle which gets tense from prolonged sitting, is always tense, it's pulling on your diaphragm, which means when you're sitting, you're able to breathe reasonably well, but your body's not moving much. And if your body's not moving much, you will feel like blood is not moving. People who sit generally feel cold if it's cold weather. The healthiest state is one when we are moving enough that our muscles and joints all get exercised, that our internal organs also get massaged, but we feel calm. And the problem is there are two states that the modern body tends to adopt. One is that calm state where nothing is moving, which is okay for the nervous system but doesn't really help blood flow or the movement and massaging of your internal organs to help things like constipation. And the other state is when you are moving and blood is flowing, but you're in a stressed environment. The stress is there because your heart rate is racing and you're feeling things like tension and stretch inside the body. What we want for ultimate health and for the ability to really be able to absorb food effectively, eliminate waste effectively, and be very efficient in our food so you don't have to eat so much, is a state where blood is flowing very easily, but you're very, very calm. Now, when the psoas is very, very tense, then it's pulling the diaphragm downwards. It's okay when you're seated, but as soon as you stand up, the diaphragm gets pulled down and you can no longer use the diaphragm to inhale. When the body detects that the diaphragm is not functioning properly, it automatically sends you into a state of sympathetic dominance, that flight or fight mode, where you turn off your immune system, digestive system, reproductive system. There are eight reasons why we need to eat. One of them is for nutrition, but it's a very, very small reason. The second reason is for fun. Well, I mean, we enjoy eating. It's for fun. Then there are other reasons, such as to promote the movement of our bowels. If you don't have healthy bowel movements, you get sick. So the body actually craves a good bowel movement. And one of the ways people give themselves a good bowel movement is by eating more food. Because the more you put in this end, the more comes out the other end. And our body knows that intuitively. So one of the reasons why we're called upon to eat more food is to go to the toilet. Another reason why we're called upon to eat is because a lot of food is not digested properly. It is actually maldigested by bacteria, the flora and fauna inside our gut actually get to the food often a lot earlier than we do. And what the result is, is fermentation, which produces things like carbon dioxide as a gas and uh, microorganisms and alcohol. And this is sometimes leading to cramps and discomfort and, you know, uh, social problems when the gases come out. But also, What also ferments inside the body is not things like sugars and things like starches in bread and rice, but you can also ferment protein. If you ferment protein, it's called putrefaction, putrefying. And then the products of putrefaction inside the body are products which are also gases, more microorganisms, but also nasty chemicals. Chemicals with names that tell you they're nasty, like putrescine and cadaverine. Would you like to be producing cadaverine inside your body? Many people do, and you can smell it on their breath. It's the smell of death. It's a really disgusting smell, and it has nasty effects on your mind. It makes you feel very uncomfortable. So people will do anything to get this feeling out of them, including putting fresh food on top of this 
fermenting, putrefying stuff inside our stomach, inside our intestines, to push it through and give you a sense of like, I feel clear again. This is not true hunger. This is just the body craving for you to put fresh food on top of the stale, rotten food. It's an important reason why we eat. Why is the fermentation taking place? Because your digestive system is not functioning. It's really important that you make your digestive system work properly. How? By ensuring that your parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, that you're not experiencing stress. Now, stress is not just listening to the news or worrying about your children or your relationships or your job. Stress also comes physically when we are unable to breathe diaphragmatically because of things like the psoas being too tight, pulling on our diaphragm and preventing the diaphragm from properly relaxing. Another reason that stress will manifest inside the body, which is a physical reason, is because of pulling your navel to your spine, using the muscles of forced abdominal exhalation, the oblique muscles. Two-thirds of people, if you tell them, pull your navel to the spine, a very, very common instruction in fitness, in health, in therapy, and just because it looks good for most people. If you ask, if you survey and actually check these people on, on real-time ultrasound, You see that two-thirds of the normal population, as soon as they pull their navel to the spine, which is technically not a wrong thing to do, it's just that two-thirds of people use the wrong muscles. And these muscles are muscles which prevent them from inhaling into the abdomen, prevent the diaphragm from working. Are you one of these people? Almost certainly. You can check right now. If you relax your abdomen, make it like a baby belly, a jelly belly, and breathe into your abdomen. Put one hand on the chest, one hand on your relaxed abdomen, and inhale. If your abdomen expands like a balloon and your chest doesn't move, that's a diaphragmatic breath. If you let the air out passively, and if you inhale so you feel the diaphragm moving down and the abdomen expanding on inhalation, that's a diaphragmatic breath. Notice it's quite relaxing. But now what I'd like you to do is to pull your navel to your spine, however you normally do that. And if you see the abdomen move inwards, so I'm pulling my abdomen inwards. Now, try and breathe into the abdomen. And if now, with your abdomen pulled inwards, when you breathe into the abdomen, you feel the chest expand or you feel any sense of discomfort or stress, that means that your method of pulling the navel to the spine has has caused diaphragmatic inhibition, basically causing you to enter a state of flight or fight causing you to turn off your digestive system, probably causing the possibility of fermentation of food, putrefaction of food, meaning that you're probably going to be hungrier sooner than you need to, not for the sake of nutrition, but rather just to push the stale food through or to encourage the relief of constipation. This is not ideal. What we want is to not be constantly gripping our abdomen If you grip your abdomen in this way, using the oblique muscles also, what it does is it prevents the movement of the spine. Because when you tighten the oblique muscles, which are shaped the way my hands are moving like this, the right oblique muscle will make you twist to left. The left external oblique muscle makes you twist to right. There are also internal obliques as well, which make you also twist in opposite directions. When you tighten both sets of the oblique muscles, they'll make the navel pull to the spine but it means your spine cannot twist in other direction in, in either direction, meaning then that your spine is locked. Now, why is it important not to have a locked spine? Well, because the internal organs, especially those of digestion, but also around them there's the organs of immunity and reproduction. These muscles, these uh, organs rather, need to be massaged. And when the internal organs get moved, get massaged, it's much easier to manage things like constipation. It's much easier to have a healthy kidneys, healthy reproductive system. But if the trunk is left immobile, your internal organs become immobile. And so they don't react as well. They don't function as well. So it's very important not to pull your navel to the spine unless you're doing it in a way where you can still comfortably breathe into your abdomen. Well, how would you learn this? Well, one of the simplest ways I teach is to simply bend the knees, 
drop your sitting bones down like a weight on a string, which is the spine, feel a relaxed abdomen, and then lean back, subject to not hurting yourself, and notice how the front of the abdomen becomes firm. But when I do this, the front is firm and my sides are totally relaxed. And if you can feel that, the front firm, the sides relaxed, you'll notice that at that time, you can actually breathe into the abdomen. It is possible, this is one of many ways, where you can tighten your abdominal muscles in a way that does not inhibit your ability to breathe in a relaxed way. So in other words, it's possible to have a strong core, but without being stressed. This is very important. When you tighten your abdomen, it must not inhibit your diaphragm. Now, another reason why we tend to choose more food is because of energy levels. People imagine that energy is an important thing to have, and it is obviously important to have energy, but the metabolism of your fuels is often with the wrong choice. Sugar is not a good fuel for most people. If you can learn to live off fat, it's a lot better a fuel. But the problem is, people fall into a cycle, and the cycle usually involves from an early age, becoming dependent on dairy products and uh, things like sugar, sugar-containing sugar products and also um, starchy things. Starchy food, sugar-containing food and um, dairy products all trigger an addictive response in the body. And things like bread and milk actually trigger the opiate receptors in the brain. They have to because a child will actually seek out its mother's breast milk because it's chemically addicted to this breast milk. Of course, we were supposed to stop drinking milk when we were stopping you know, breastfeeding at two or three years old or less or more, depending on what you believe. But people keep on drinking milk and dairy products most of their life in the modern world. And this actually continues the opiate-like addiction. And this similar opiate-like addiction is coming from things like bread and rice. Most people are addicted to foods, and that's one of the reasons why they eat a lot. And sugar has also been shown to have many addictive qualities. Problem with sugar is that as soon as the sugar runs out, you feel like you've drained yourself of energy. So a better fuel source rather than sugar is fat. If you can live off high quality fats, things coming like I prefer my fats coming from green vegetables. I also eat fat from avocado and coconut and a few other different oils. Like sometimes I add olive oil to my diet as well. And you know, there's arguments to say that although I'm a vegan, there are many people who eat high quality animal fats as well. And there is an argument for them as well. But the thing is, if you live off fat, it doesn't keep you as hungry. If, you're, if fat is your main fuel source, you don't wake up hungry as much. It's also important to acknowledge that when you burn glucose or sugar as a fuel inside your body, it can be burnt in two ways. It can be burnt aerobically or anaerobically. Anaerobic metabolism or the burning of sugar as a fuel anaerobically, is where you burn or metabolize a sugar molecule in the absence of oxygen. Aerobic metabolism of glucose or sugar is done in the presence of, of oxygen. Now, if you burn, metabolize a glucose molecule, a sugar molecule, in the, in the absence of oxygen, one glucose molecule yields two molecules of ATP, which is an energy currency, an energy molecule in your cells. Um, but if you burn or metabolize a glucose molecule in the presence of oxygen, you get 38 molecules of ATP. In other words, 19 times as much energy comes if you can get oxygen into your cells so that you metabolize glucose in the presence of oxygen. I'll say that again. One sugar molecule will yield two energy currencies, ATP molecules, in the absence of oxygen. One sugar molecule will yield 38 molecules 
of of uh, ATP or energy currencies in the presence of oxygen, when you burn it in the presence of oxygen. How do you encourage aerobic metabolism of glucose? Well, you've got to get oxygen into the cells. Only problem is, contrary to popular belief, the more you breathe, the less oxygen comes into your cells. It's really important to understand the metabolism of oxygen and carbon dioxide inside the body. When we breathe the air around us, this air contains about 79% nitrogen, about 20% of um, oxygen, maybe about half a percent of carbon dioxide, and half a percent of other gases, hydrogen, helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, this sort of thing, and toxic things as well. But Essentially, our body will only function adequately at a cellular level if you have about 6 or 7% oxygen and about 6 or 7% carbon dioxide. Which means when we breathe the air around us, you've actually got 20% oxygen, which is about three times as much oxygen as you need. And you've only got 0.5% carbon dioxide, which is about 14 times too little carbon dioxide. So one of the main purposes of respiration is to increase carbon dioxide levels by 14 times and decrease oxygen levels by three times. So what we've got is something that nature created very magnificently. Nature is wonderful. You know, you can create a garden. And no matter how much you spend time looking after your garden, if you go away for a few weeks, when you come back, the garden's a mess. But nature makes wonderful things like rainforests, and you can leave them for a long, long time, and they stay perfect. Nature has a very good way of creating really amazing things. Can we do better than nature? Well, maybe. But nature gave us natural breathing, the type of breathing we did when we were children, the type of breathing that many people still do while they're asleep. It's what we're doing in our most regenerative, replenitative cycle when we're sleeping. Natural breathing is five things. It's inhalation, which is low, exhalation, which is passive. There's not much of it. You can even forget about it and get on with the rest of your life. And it's through the nose. This type of minimal, invisible, inaudible, relaxing breathing is the best breath for your energy levels. But it's only possible if you've got a relaxed, regular length source. If you're not fully gripping either the pelvic floor or your abdomen in a way which inhibits the diaphragm, it's only possible if you're not forcing your breath. And when you learn or relearn to breathe naturally, what starts to happen is carbon dioxide levels will start to come to the adequate level that's required for the entry of oxygen into your cells. If there's not enough carbon dioxide because you've lost natural breathing or if you're consciously over breathing, then what happens is the oxyhemoglobin, the red pigment in the blood will no longer be able to release its oxygen to your cells, in which case the cells can only metabolize glucose anaerobically, meaning that you'll need 19 times as much food effectively. I'm keeping it simple because I don't want to make this a complex biochemistry talk, but carbon dioxide is not the enemy that many people think it is. Carbon dioxide feeds the trees. Carbon dioxide inside our body at the right levels will encourage the flow of blood to our brain, blood to our heart. It will encourage the flow of oxygen from our lungs into our blood. Carbon dioxide calms the nervous system. It encourages that state which helps digestion, immunity and reproduction. And carbon dioxide is this important signal which says it's okay to release the oxygen from the blood cells and put them into your body cells to make 19 times more energy. If you over-breathe, if you breathe deeply into the chest or shallowly into the chest effectively, but many people think that deep breathing is deep breath in and puff up the chest. This is shallow, fast, short breathing. It's over-breathing. 
If you do this type of breathing, it effectively causes hyperventilation, which is more breathing than natural breathing offers, and it starts to lead to a depletion of your carbon dioxide levels, meaning you're going to get less blood flow to the brain, less blood flow to your heart, less transfer of oxygen from your lungs to your blood, meaning you're going to get things like dizziness, lack of energy. You're going to get not enough Uh, calmness in your nervous system, which means you're going to be jittery and more in pain. This is why many people, when they do freestyle swimming, and if you recall, freestyle swimming is where you go, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. And often I see children being taught with the notion of breathing in, Right arm, breathe out, left arm. So it's breathing arm, bubble arm, breathe arm, bubble arm. So they say, say in the kids' um, uh, swimming classes. This leads to hyperventilation, which causes excessive hunger. How many people do you know? Are you one of the people who goes swimming and then afterwards is surprisingly hungry? Many people say they are. Why? Not because it's more exercise, but because you've doing, been doing a conscious over breathing exercise. If an Olympic swimmer swims 50 meters, often they'll do it without breathing at all. Even I can swim 60 or 70 meters on one breath, but more elite athletes learn to breathe less while doing more. Someone who breathes less while doing more is considered fit and healthy. Someone who breathes more while doing less is considered an unfit, unhealthy person. So what you want, if you want to learn how to be doing things which allow you to not have to eat so much, to choose food which is going to be good for you, is to make sure that your psoas is not compressed. Learn to sit less and lengthen the psoas muscle more. Simple movements like this can lengthen the psoas muscle easily. And even better, the same thing in the air where you balance on one leg and you turn your rear thigh inwards while bending the spine forward, lengthening the right side and twisting to the right side if I want to release my right psoas. This can help free up the diaphragm. Consciously breathing low into your abdomen and reminding yourself to breathe naturally will help as well. The other thing which I can touch upon is that the more you learn to relax your breath and eventually learn how to breathe less than normal, which is more advanced, the more carbonic acid builds up inside the body. And carbonic acid is a type of um, very gentle, mild acidity inside the body. This acidity, I said already, causes a calming of your nervous system. Without carbonic acid to calm your nervous system, you require other acidity. And that other acidity to calm the nervous system is often craved in people's diets with acidic foods, foods which contain higher levels of protein and other acidic substances, often which are not that good for your body, more chemical-like substances. So one of the most important type of foods everyone knows is good for them is fruits and salads and vegetables. Isn't this the food that everyone says is good for you? It's pretty much the food that I live off, fruit, salad and vegetables. These are very alkalizing food, but most people will never eat enough fruit and vegetables because it's too alkalizing. If you live off fruit and vegetables, you'll feel very, very sort of uh, sensitive because alkalizing foods lead to a hypersensitivity of your nervous system. To balance your nervous system in the best way for long-term health, you need more alkalizing foods, more fruit and vegetables. Doesn't everyone say they're good for you? plus learning how to breathe less. Isn't that what fit people do? When you breathe less than normal, you create a very gentle acidity inside the body, which calms your nervous system and encourages blood flow. And when you eat fruit, salad and vegetables, it helps nurture so many parts of your body. And it also gives the alkalinity to balance the acidity. You see, if you just live off acidic foods, it will force you to breathe more than normal and leach calcium from your bones, leading to stress and osteoporosis. Please consider what I'm saying. I'm trying to put it into a very short, brief, quick explanation. 
basically you have the power to control your choice of food and how much you eat. Do it by restoring natural movement, by restoring natural breathing. Tense less, stretch less, breathe less, think less. Move actively, move from your core, breathe naturally, breathe from your core and find a way of fluidly moving the internal organs to get rid of things like constipation, to encourage natural digestion, to encourage healthy approach to eating so that then you're not someone who's constantly craving food but rather someone who enjoys your life and food becomes a choice. You know, my diet is one which many people are jealous of. What's my diet? Freedom. I eat whatever I like, whenever I like, however much I want. When people say, what do you actually eat? I eat fruit, salad and vegetables. I eat one meal a day. It's all I want to eat. If I wanted more, I'd eat more. But that's enough for me. Why? It satiates me. If I wanted more, I'd eat more. And sometimes I do just for fun. But to be a victim of food, to have the need to eat because your body is craving it, is just a loss of freedom in my books. There is a way to be more in control of your life. Restore natural breathing, natural movement. Get off your chairs to some simple movements of your trunk. Lengthen the front of the hips. Lengthen your lower back. Breathe into your abdomen. Stay relaxed. Thank you for listening.